Welcome to Online Off Script, where we discuss trending marketing topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, the New Orleans Managing Director at Online Optimism. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Social Media Director. This week, we're talking about esports and the impact that video games have on our lives. Our guest today is Lindsay the Boss Poss, Executive Producer and Women in Gaming Lead. Her current work focuses on creating content by women for women in the gaming industry. She also consults on small business development for her company, All In Solutions. Lindsay is passionate about entrepreneurship, data analytics, technology, and gaming. Thanks for joining us, Lindsay. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a nice, nice sunny day here in DC. I have nothing to complain about, and I'm really excited to be on this end of a podcast for once. <laughs> I know. I, we listened to your podcast a little bit. It's awesome. So um, we're glad to have kind of an experienced person joining us as our first guest. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is, is how did you get started working in esports and gaming? How did that come to be? And, and what do you do? What's your current job and position? So this is sort of my little secret that's not such a well-known secret, but I'm not a huge gamer myself. Um, I am married to a gamer, and I grew up with a brother who was fairly interested in gaming, but I am not a a mouse and keyboard or even a console kind of heavy into gaming gamer. Um, I am definitely a mobile phones kind of gal. So or mobile games on my phone kind of gal. Yeah, yeah. A little bit more relaxed, the hyper casual kind of side of things. But I had started work at a small technology focused think tank, and I had a coworker who got really into blockchain research. And she started looking at okay. blockchain, and we started learning more and more about microtransactions. Microtransactions definitely do happen on the blockchain, but a lot of times they happen in gaming. And I sort of started just poking around in this gaming side of things and thought, hey, there's actually a lot going on here. Um, and from a tech policy perspective or from just a future tech how we spend our time perspective, I was really interested. Um, And again, I I kind of seen gaming my whole life, but hadn't had the slightest clue as to how big or how pervasive it was or how how powerful a form of entertainment it was. And then I read a Netflix report. It was actually the 2018 shareholders report where they said, we lose more to Fortnite than we do to HBO. Wow. And I thought, oh my gosh. Yeah. So even the streaming companies are, you know, thinking about gaming as this, this is how people are spending their time. And so from a research perspective and from an interest in technology perspective, I was sort of like, oh man, nobody's looking at this as as they should be in, in, in my current field. So I just started poking around and getting more and more into it and attended a couple conferences, met some people who are really into the space who have been basically shouting this message from the rooftops for years <laughs> and kind of linked up with them and started working and, and reading more and listening more and thinking more about gaming and bringing my own perspective of technology and economics and data analytics to their side of being really into gaming and wound up being this really fun partnership where I was sort of an in, insider outsider in this world. I had a different perspective yeah. Yeah. than the hardcore folks. Yeah, and I've just I've just been now it's been about two years since I started that project. I've published a paper, done a bunch of op eds. Um, I now work as a executive producer for a company called Holodeck Media, where we cover a lot of gaming verticals. Uh, it's gaming specific kind of publications. Started out with the business of esports, uh, which is their Holodeck Media's flagship production. We do a live news show where I got to be a pundit, very like ESPN style roundtable kind cool. of thing where we all give our hot takes. Very fun. Um, and then from that live show, that live live stream, spawned off into having my own podcast that's focused in women in gaming because um, there weren't a ton of people that looked like me. <laughs> yeah. So trying to find and highlight that work. <laughs> Love that. So what's your day-to-day look like? Uh, uh, What do you do kind of every day in gaming or around gaming? It's a lot of managing the podcast, quite honestly. And I'm sure you all will learn this too. Getting, Getting guests and having conversations. And the wonderful thing I think about catering to a specific niche in gaming is that that niche is very willing to collaborate and share their own resources and their own folks with me. So it's been nice because I'll interview one person and they'll recommend another person. Um, But that requires a lot of, a lot of talking. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I went from sort of being in an office and doing research to just a ton of meeting and talking to people, um, which is very fun. 
I, I am an extroverted introvert. So I sort of enjoy <laughs> both. Um, yeah. spend a lot of time doing research still and writing scripts, but that research is more focused now on who I'm talking to, what they're, what they're currently working on, what it means for the gaming space, um, and what it means for this whole metaverse idea, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, Ooh. but yeah, the, the day we'll to day is a lot of a just, second. yep. <laughs> day to day is a lot of just, uh, kind of management and talking to people and, still a little bit of that research element. Yeah. So gaming, I mean, there is a million different jobs you can do in the gaming industry. And what advice would you give to someone who wanted to get started? Um, you know, there's kind of the technical side, these the artistic side, the, you know, you know, there's so many different sides to it. So what do you talk to people? Do people reach out to you and ask you about getting started in the industry? And, and what do you say to them? All the time. Um, I've had several people kind of reach out and just ask where they can look for jobs even. And there's a couple websites that have popped up for gaming specific jobs now. I do recommend that people who want to work in gaming, if you are going to maybe a degree program or even if you're in high school, taking some sort of basic business classes, taking some oh. marketing, um, even finances, planning, all of that. If you are a non-technical person, of course, if you're yeah. really great at software engineering, go for it. Do all the technical <laughs> stuff. Go be a game developer. But if you're on the non-technical side, any form of basic, you know, I'm trying to think about business, marketing, accounting, uh, entrepreneurship, all of that kind of, all of those courses, all of that classwork, all of that experience can be pretty much directly translated somehow into the gaming industry. And we're early enough on that all of those soft skills or non-technical jobs are still really highly coveted. Um, there's a couple websites I always recommend. One is called Hitmarker, which is a great one to look at if you're interested in the gaming industry. If you're a woman who's interested, there's a nonprofit called Women in Games International, or Wiggy for short. They have an awesome jobs board. And then I know of a couple Discord servers, I'm really active on Discord. There's a lot of Discord servers that specifically have job channels where people will post jobs. So if you have a feel safer example, you're interested in education, find a Discord that's gaming and education, and usually there will be a channel where people will post jobs for that specific group. Yeah. I feel like there's a real misunderstanding that you have to be like a coder to like work in games. I was and just like, going to say that, yeah, that there's so many different ways that you could work in games. Yeah, like you have to write storylines, mm -hmm. you have to market them, like... Yeah, I mean, the whole industry is so wide. My my sister is actually a video game designer. Oh, so I've talked oh, to her a little cool. bit about this and uh, she went to school for video game design. And I think, I think, don't quote me on this, even though I'm saying it on a podcast, but I think <laughs> she's got a dual degree in, in some sort of programming and game theory, like game yeah. design theory. Uh, she went to a school called DigiPen, oh, um, which I'm not sure if you, you've heard of, Lindsay. It's in, it's in Washington State. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting to see that technical side, but like Mira said, there's a ton of different jobs where marketing, business strategy, how do you actually build the game? How do you promote it? Um, you know, where does it go? And, yeah. and it has to release almost like a like a feature film. Oh, and yeah. these games have to be constantly updated, right? I mean, that's how they make money is by constantly updating them and, and re-releasing them, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, they also are, are businesses at the end of the day as well. Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. Any, and they're trying to make money too. So any kind of skill that you have that leans towards business is, is definitely sought after. Yeah. yeah. Don't have to be. Don't have to code a program, although that's also sought after. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I know that gaming is changing and there's a lot of talk about virtual reality. We've got the metaverse coming, all of these different things. Do you think VR is here to stay? And how do you think that's going to progress as we keep going with games? So this is always a fun question to answer because the honest truth is that I think we just can't predict the direction technology is going. We... I mean, 15 years ago, even five, 10 years ago, I don't think anyone would have predicted the power of phones, the power of social media, the power of software. And it's not just hardware, it's software, right? I I would love to say I'm a huge believer in VR. Um, I frankly think that AR has more useful applications right now because we do all carry around phones and it's yeah. easier to kind of build AR experiences. Uh, it's a little bit just less of a barrier to entry there. I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have been learning a lot recently about fitness in 
and uh, VR, which has been really cool. And I think that there's there's just so much potential in sort of every area of life. I think it's a little bit hard for me to say this is the thing that's really going to get us there. Do I think that technology is going to continue to evolve and that we're all eventually going to have some sort of pod like or thing? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Headsets, you know, headsets just walking and around a treadmill <laughs> and all of that. I actually do think that's going to happen because yeah. it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. very entertaining. Um, so I, I, I think that we're going to have a lot more development into the hardware side. I think that we're going to have things that we haven't even thought of. You know, Snapchat actually just recently launched a augmented reality ability that allows you to try on clothes in stores. Oh, cool. And so yeah. it goes, yeah, it goes that. way beyond entertainment too. I think a lot of how we shop and interact with the world will change. I need I all the help honestly, I can there's... get with shopping. So that's <laughs> <Yeah>. really... <laughs> it's nice. I think that changes. I think it will be largely good too. I think a lot of us have a lot of anxieties about the real world. Um, and especially over the past two years, those have really come to light. And I think that there can be a lot of different ways for people who are are neuroatypical to interact with the world, people who have more, more, more nerves. I mean, just the growth in therapy alone has been huge. So I largely believe in all these changes being good. That being said, I also think that the value of in-person interactions is never going to fully go away. So we might change the way we shop or the way we work or the way we work out. I still think there's going to be a lot of specialness in real world connections. And frankly, it might be that we learn to value those a little more if we're spending more time online or with devices. So I'm, I'm very hopeful, I guess, but I have no idea what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard I, to predict. I remember five years ago when I was interviewing to be an intern here, I got the question, what do you think is going to be the top uh, social media network in five years? And I was like, I don't think it exists yet. Yeah. And that felt like a really bold answer. But here we are with TikTok and Facebook now losing money. Yeah. yeah. So yep. and, you literally never know it's around the corner. And speaking on mobile games, uh, you know, I did a project in, in college 10 years ago about you know, growing industries. And I remember doing a case study on Temple Run. Do you remember Temple Run? <laughs> oh, Temple heck Run. yeah. Oh, what heck do you mean, do yeah. I remember Temple Run? You're oh looking at God. a Temple Run champion. Oh my God. <laughs> Temple Run uh, just was so addictive and and everyone was playing it at the time. And I remember my professor was saying like, you know, you really think that these mobile games are going to make money? And I, and I said... <laughs> Yes, they make tons of money from in-app purchases, from downloads and yeah. all this stuff. And they just weren't Ads. quite with it yet. And yeah. now I, I, it's just amazing to Whenever see how much they've grown. You see an ad for like a sketchy puzzle game and yeah. they're like, do this 10 minutes a day and it'll improve your brain function. You're probably like, who down me? I download Exactly. That. I love those games. <laughs> those ads. Those are my forte as well. Are you guys <laughs> Wordle, Wordle players? Oh, Wordle. I got Wordle in three every day for an entire week, and I was so proud of myself. Heck yeah! Wordle is the only way that my group chats start these days. It's like if you're not if you're not starting with Wordle, then, then yeah. you're nowhere. Exactly, and I think that there's a lot of power to be had in these types of interactions because Wordle to me is this, is particularly special because it is once a day. Yeah. Um. And so it's like for one brief moment every morning, kind of everyone is united yeah. in, in doing this You're thing. You're on the same and page. And, <laughs> and we also yeah. have this like really unique, like undeclared, but unanimously decided social code that you don't spoil the Wordle. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. no one had to go out there and say like, don't spoil the Wordle. Like, yeah. We all just yeah. knew. Yeah. I accidentally spoiled the Wordle when I first, I just oh. didn't know how to share. I didn't, I didn't click the share button. I screenshot it oh, and sent no. it. And uh. so that was the first time I did it. I'm, I'm done with that. I know how to send Wordles now. You're I'm monster. good. I'm a thousand years old. Sorry. <laughs> well, okay. So you had mentioned that you, like, we've especially seen this big shift in gaming, um, especially with like COVID in the past couple of years. Um, how have esports and gaming in general changed since you started working in them to now? It's a good question. I haven't been in this industry for too terribly long, I will say. I guess the most interesting thing that's happened is the pandemic and seeing that change. So the explosion in growth during the pandemic was of no surprise to people who have been watching the industry. Being stuck at home with little else to do, it's it's totally not a surprise at all. Switch also nailed it with uh, Animal Crossing Animal coming Crossing. out at the yeah. very yeah. start of a pandemic. Yeah. 
Well, so, and that's, it's funny that you bring that up because Warzone also kind of came out, Call of Duty Warzone also kind of came out right during the pandemic. And the biggest thing about these games is that it was an easy way for people to connect with friends without having to be in a phone call or be in a FaceTime or even, even over chat or text, Mm -hmm. you could log in and play a game together. It's way easier. I, you know, my husband plays with friends that live in England, um, yeah. and that live overseas where they all can get together once a week and actually have the time to sit down and play with each other and chat and catch up. But it's sort of the big, the biggest thing in gaming is we talk about how it's not a lean back experience. Watching TV and talking on the phone to an extent is a lean back experience. You're not sort of actively engaged. You're not moving. You're not thinking about the thing that you're doing. You're just sort of sitting back and taking it in. Gaming is a lean forward experience. You have to be actively engaged. You have to make decisions. You have to think on your feet. And I think that people are learning the value of combining that with um, time spent with friends and time spent catching up in a way that maybe is way more accelerated because of the pandemic. I I like that you say lean forward and lean back because when I think of a lean back experience, I think of literally turning my brain off. That's like how how I think Mm -hmm. of it. I'm not thinking, I'm not trying, I'm not doing anything. I'm just relaxing. And a lean forward is, is really being active. And I like the way you worded that. I just wanted to put that out there. (laughs) I would love to take credit for that, but that's an industry thing. (laughs) So I feel like even though there's been this explosion and like people playing, I still automatically like think of honestly straight white men, um, playing video games. Um, all the people that I know who exploded into video game, like traditional, like working with people, video games Mm -hmm. fit that category. Have you seen a change in representation with like women, people of color, um, LGBTQ identities? Have you seen a shift in that in in gaming? It's it's first really important to note that when people think gaming or esports, they usually do automatically think of the games that attract straight white men. They think gaming is Call of Duty and it's just not. It took me a long time to come to grips with the fact that I am a gamer, even though I play just mobile games. I can still interact with this industry. I still am contributing to it, right? Because I'm playing these games and I'm watching the ads and I I might not be making in-game purchases, but I certainly know people who (laughs) make in-game purchases on mobile games. So that's just, first of all, we have to expand the definition of the industry. And when we do that, there is a lot more people included, which is good because they should be. Um, And now we're starting to see a rise in a lot more communities that actually welcome those types of folks who are a little bit more, they're just less intense. They're not going to sit down and play League of Legends for 10 hours on a PC. That doesn't mean that they don't understand the power and value in gaming and interact with that as a medium. So I've seen more companies working to actually cater to those people. I don't know if you all know, but some of the most successful divisions of companies are the mobile divisions. And so companies are learning to really value that customer. And that customer actually tends to be a lot more female. Um, and then they're also learning to value outside markets. So to your point about uh, eth- or, yeah, racial and ethnic diversity, the Latin American market is exploding. The Asian market has been more powerful than the the Western market for a while. But the Latin American and Indian markets are exploding. The Middle East is just exploding. Weirdly, Saudi Arabia, which has its own issues, is one of the one of the countries that's investing the most in gaming. So we're seeing a lot more people being added. And as more and more people are being added, I think companies are starting to realize, hey, we shouldn't just cater to straight white men because we're then shooting ourselves in the foot and cutting off a huge portion of our consumer base that we could also be making money off of. So in the past couple of years, you've seen a lot more character introductions of people of color, of people who are um, who have diverse sexual identities and diverse genders and all of that. So it's still dominated by straight white men. And I don't want to paint the illusion that it's not. But companies are coming to the tune that not only is this just better, because it's way better to have more voices at the table, it actually is more profitable. (laughs) Um, I recently had a guest on my podcast who said DEI equals ROI. And I thought that was a really succinct way of putting it because it's true. The more people you cater to, the more you're inviting people to spend money on your product. (laughs) So they're changing the games themselves. They're changing the marketing and the promotion of the game. But they're also educating and informing people like yourself, that you are gamers, right? That's yeah. the idea, is, mm-hmm. is opening up the umbrella and saying, you know, you've already been a gamer for 10 years. You just didn't realize it or identify as a gamer. And now 
we're including you and, and making it known that you are part of this community, which I kind of like. Yeah. I always joke that I'm a gamer because I love The Sims. <laughs> Sims are great. Yeah. I'm like this close Absolutely. to building a PC so I can play <laughs> The Sims more efficiently. You would not be the first one and you won't be the last. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I want to customize it with like LED lights. Like <laughs> I will be full gamer mode. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in to Online Off Script. Listen to part two of this episode on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube, where we finish our conversation with Lindsay the Boss Poss about gaming, technology, and more. And as always, stay optimistic. <laughs>